It is a dark winter night, and the city is getting ready to go to sleep. In a big apartment building, a kitchen window is lit. On the other side, a young woman and her daughter are looking into the darkness and pointing at the stars. The woman is telling stories, feeding the growing curiosity of her daughter, but questions keep coming. If I had to look back, that would be the first time I recall looking up at the sky. We all share similar memories, stargazing nights with family or friends, hoping to see a shooting star to make a wish. And I wonder, how many of you tried to count stars? How many of you felt intimidated by the size of the universe? <laughs> and how many of you have fallen asleep while stargazing? <laughs> Over time, I managed to answer some of the questions that intrigued me back then, but I'm still working on others. This is a bit embarrassing, but up until I was four or five, I was convinced that the sky, with the sun during the day and the moon and the stars during the night, were just theater curtains that someone was in charge of changing. I was not sad, though, when I learned the truth, because it opened me the door to a wall of possibilities. According to the Oxford Dictionary, Astronomy is the science that studies celestial objects, the space, and the universe as a whole. Is that clear? Perhaps not much. What do we understand as celestial objects? The definition can be used all the way from meteorites, which can be as small as a grain of sun, up to planets or stars, or even whole galaxies. So pretty much everything that lies beyond our atmosphere. Nowadays, we, the astronomers prefer to be called astrophysicists in order to respect the professional field of the astrologist. Trust me, I've lost count of the number of times that I've been asked to read a hand or to do a horoscope. <laughs> yes, we study the stars. No, we don't predict people's fortunes. <laughs> and what does astronomy have in particular that has made us wonder for generations? Questions about where we come from, or whether we are alone in the universe, have fueled our imaginations for centuries, producing cultures rich in myth. But that's not what fools mine. Don't get me wrong, we all like a bit of valiant debate over a beer from time to time, but that's not my thing. What makes me wonder are the scales, or the sizes. I remember a visit I did to the Sequoia National Park a couple of years ago. I was walking through the forest and I saw this sign that said, how big is big? And I was standing next to the sign, which was already taller than me, next to one of those immense sequoias. And it made me feel small and insignificant. And I have the same feeling in astronomy. The time over which processes happen, the masses of the objects and the distances between them, they are all enormous scales and they're almost impossible to imagine. I know you've heard comparisons to thousands of millions of stadiums, but I know that doing those comparisons with everyday objects does not help to better understand the concepts. So the question is, how big is big? Even in astronomy, that is a tough question. What we call small and large will depend on our field of study. If you ask someone that is working with planets, they will tell you that a star is quite large. But if you ask someone that is working with the structure of the universe, they will tell you that a star is, like me next to the sequoia, just insignificant. But it is not all about the size, or so they say. <laughs> <laughs> what really makes me wonder is the interplay between those scales, how the large scales determine what the small ones can do, and how the small scale processes work together to shape the big picture. Here? is an image of the Andromeda galaxy, also known as M31. Among the galaxies that surround us, this is the brightest one, to the extent that it can be seen with, a clear, with your naked eye on a clear night. Do you see its disk-like shape? By developing and observationally testing theories of galaxy formation, we have learned that galaxies form from a, the contraction of a big halo of gas. And the only reason why this gas can collapse is because it can lose energy thanks to the interactions among the atomic, uh, on the atomic level. 
So it is those interactions among the atoms that compose the gas, what allows the gas to collapse and settle into the disk of the galaxy. This constant interplay of scales might seem difficult to understand at first, but we have a tool to shed light on it, and it's called the scientific method. This method allows us to learn from nature with just five steps. First one, formulation of a question. We observe a phenomena in nature that we want to learn about, and so we formulate a simple question about it. Second, hypothesis. From what we already know, we conjecture what the answer can be. Third, prediction. This one is especially relevant. Scientific models and theories not only are capable of describing nature, but they're also capable of predicting events. Four, the testing. This is the most well-known, because here is where the actual experiments are being performed. And five, analysis. With this, we can evaluate whether our hypothesis is correct or not. Different sciences may differ on the way they do the testing step, but they all use the scientific method to build knowledge. For example, if you ask biologists how do they face research, they will tell you how the most important thing is to be able to control all the variables that may play a role in whatever it is that you want to study. And then they will start talking about all sorts of experiments that can be done, uh, in which they can replicate over and over the exact same conditions in order to investigate what are the most relevant variables. In astronomy, we cannot do that. Imagine you want to study how a galaxy like Andromeda here forms. What can we do? In the same way that paleontologists can reconstruct the evolutionary trajectory of a given species using only fossils, which are fragments of that history, we must construct the formation history of, of a galaxy using only examples similar to that galaxy, and sometimes actual glimpses into the past. With that, we can put forward theories to try to explain these processes. And then we try to prove those theories wrong. Once we've proven them wrong, because that will happen, you have to adjust the theory and try again. These theories are never set in stone but they are constantly developing to better describe what we observe. There's another solution, and that is to put all our knowledge into a computer to create a virtual galaxy in a simulation to actually replicate how the birth of that galaxy has been. Numerical simulations are very important in astronomy because they allow us to change the properties of the universe and so to build the bridge between observations and the models. Like in the real universe, our simulated galaxies are made of particles, but because we do not have the computational power available to treat each star in your galaxy individually, what we call particles actually correspond to chunks of mass that can correspond up to several millions of stars like the Sun. That is not what one thinks by the word particle, right? To design these big numerical simulations, we first need to think how different physical processes will affect one of our particles. And then we write a code in which we sim simulate all those different physical processes for several millions of particles. Once we've run the simulation, we can compare the results with the observations to see whether the physical ingredients that we have implemented in our simulation correctly describe the observed properties of the galaxies or not. Designing one of these big numerical simulations is not a trivial problem because there's many, many physical mechanisms that need to be accounted for. Another very important issue is the number of particles that we use to describe these galaxies. The smaller the number of particles, the faster we can run our simulation but the less information we're going to obtain out of it. So we have to constantly trade off between computational speed and precision. I am a PhD student at the University of Heidelberg, and I'm not inter interested as much in these objects, but actually in these others, which are called stellar clusters. A stellar cluster is a group of stars that has formed at the same time, in the same place of the galaxy, and that is held together by the gravitational interaction among each other. Here is another image of the Andromeda galaxy. 
do you see that in the bottom right corner, there is a blue circle? That circle corresponds to its brightest stellar cluster in that galaxy. And you can see that there's quite a difference between a, a stellar cluster and a galaxy. My field has developed mainly from observations. And over the years, people have found many different types of stellar clusters, being the two most well-known, these two, which are called open clusters or globular clusters. The first time that I heard about these objects, I was on my second year of uni back in Barcelona. And the thing that I most clearly remember about that lecture is how much they emphasized on the differences between them. Open clusters are young, they have very few stars and some diffuse gas, whereas global clusters are old. They have up to several thousands of stars and they have no gas at all. So the question is, how did these objects form? Here there's a bit of debate, as usual. Seeing how different the properties are, some people suggest that these objects form following two complete different physical processes and that you cannot compare them in any way. On the other hand, there are some other people who suggest that these objects form following the same physical process, but because these objects are orbiting in the galaxy, and so they are evolving inside of that galaxy, what happens throughout their life will modify their aspect, and so will change how we see them nowadays. I'm working with that second hypothesis, and it is not a trivial problem, because we have to work from the larger scales of how does the galaxy form and evolve through cosmic time, down to the small scales of how the, the clusters form from the gas sitting in the galaxy and how they evolve inside of that galaxy and how they keep interacting with that gas throughout their lifetimes. In order to work with such an interplay of scales, I have to use numerical simulations, which allow me to replicate how galaxies and clusters form, evolve and interact throughout, throughout their lifetimes. I will end up comparing my simulations with observations, those al which will allow me to evaluate our hypothesis on the stellar cluster formation, thus fulfilling the last step of the scientific method. The complexity of the interplays of scales may obscure the way to the truth behind it, but armed with a scientific method and some effort and dedication, I know I can light my way out from the darkness. Thank you.